right, I've got Montgomery on the brain, I'm from Montgomery, I'm from Maryland, the Maryland Collegiate STEM Conference. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to introduce one of the, the, the people who had a lot to do with getting this, this whole thing started and has been an inspiration for us. So, Dr. Jane from Mercer College. Right. Good afternoon. Um, I'm glad to be here. My name is Lulu Chang, and I'm the Vice President for the Academic Affairs at Mercer County Community College in New Jersey. So, you're wondering that why I'm here, right? If you're not part of Maryland. I used to be, actually I just left from Montgomery College last summer. I used to be Dean of Science and Engineering and um, Advanced uh, at Montgomery College Rockville campus, okay, until August, and then I left. Uh, but uh, I want to give you a little story about uh, how this conference was initiated uh, last November, and then I'll introduce uh, the, the keynote speaker uh, in five to ten minutes, okay? If it is okay with that. Anyway, okay, so uh, what happened was this. Uh, a uh, group of uh, faculty uh, from Maryland went to a conference called the STEM Tech Conference in Atlanta, Georgia last October, uh, organized by the Lingo Innovations. And at the conference, in fact, actually a group of us got together and talked about the potential conference for our STEM students in the state of Maryland. And after we came back, uh, Professor Ken Khan at the Carroll Community College contacted me and said that well, we should have to do something about this one. What do you think? And I said that I'm glad to tackle th on this issue. And why don't we work together? So we had a, several phone conferences and email exchanges. And we decided to share this idea with the faculty from Maryland Community Colleges. So we actually arranged the one section at the APAC meeting in January. I believe it was at, uh, was it Prince George Community College? Yes. So we went there, and then it was extremely well attended, by the way. Almost 30 people showed up, Evan, representing almost 10 community colleges. And every single attendee loved the idea. So I shared this among my vision, and then Dr. Khan actually led the discussion, and he shared his vision about this one. And then we actually pretty much actually set the, what we wanted to do timeline-wise and everything. It was an ambitious timeline, by the way. I mean, starting something in January and make the conference happen in October was not easy to imagine, but actually we, we did it. So after that conference, what we did was that uh, Professor Khan and I sent out emails to the President and the Vice President for Academic Affairs at all 16 community colleges in the state of Maryland, and inviting them to join uh, for the steering committee, representing each college that you should send one administrator and one faculty. Okay? And uh, so uh, we got response from about almost 12 community colleges. And then uh, we uh, uh, formed the steering committee and then we had the first phone conference in February. And after that, in fact, uh, 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 Professor Khan and then also the uh, uh, BCCC, Baltimore City Community College, was heavily involved in this process as well. And then they actually believe that we need to have a s several subcommittees, like a registration committee, exhibition committee, program committee, bylaw committee, and so on. And then actually we formed those committees to run the program really more effectively. And we all worked really, really hard okay, since then. Then at the end of spring, okay, somebody had to host the conference. So I checked with my boss at Rockland campus, Dr. Judy Eckerman, and also the Margaret Lapner, who is provost at Germantown campus, because we're opening this building, okay, right now here, okay, in August, it's scheduled to open. So I said that Margaret, that, okay, why don't you host this one? And it's going to be a great one to celebrate this new building. And she said, absolutely, I'll support it. So Dr. Eckerman and then the, the, uh, the provost, uh, Ledmer, said that everything is going to be done and whatever you need, actually ask about it and so on. So we worked hard, so we made sure that actually the first meeting is going to be at Montgomery College. And after that, whoever wanted to, okay, it's your chance. So if you want to host this conference next year, please let Dr. Khan know about this one. But then actually what happened was that when I left from this college during the summer, I had to give it up to somebody. And then I was looking it over, and then the Dean Hammond, who has been at Germantown campus for a long time, and he is, I respect him wholeheartedly, so I asked him that, could you please take over my responsibility and then make it happen? And that he was glad to do that, and then he made it happen. And, okay, I, I want to say this. This conference could not be happened if Dr. Khan did not agree to do this one. I mean, he spent 24-7 for this conference. about several months, okay. 
Okay, including the logo, actually, you can see that that was designed and done by Carroll Community College students. Right, Raza? Yes. Yes, actually. And then there was a competition about it, an art class and so on, and, and it was done by the students. So everything is done very, very well, and I'm so glad. And then also I actually said this. Uh, I, when I left from this place, I said that, you know what, this conference, I promise I'll come back. Because there was a condition, he released me, the Raza released me from this uh, obligation, and so on. But to be honest with you, when we designed this one last uh, January, and Raza and I talked about it, okay, how many people are going to attend this conference? And then I predicted about 50 to 80, then it would be great success. I was wrong. And it's hard for administrative to accept, I you know, say it's wrong, but I, I would say wrong. So recently, about two weeks ago, when he sent me an email, he said that, Uru, you are wrong, so you owe me a Tesla. <laughs> so I told him that uh, I'll go to Vegas, I used to live in Vegas, so I, I will get to go to Vegas, and then if they win the jackpot, I'll give it to you. <laughs> and he specifically ordered that you have to give me the red one. <laughs> But anyway, I'm so glad that actually we are doing this one and that we have more than 300 people attending this conference. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> and yesterday we had 175 students here flocked in and then the speaker was targeting the students and talking very good one. And then today, I would like to introduce my keynote speaker, who is a friend of mine. I've known him for many, many years. He has been a leader of a community college in terms of the biomedical sciences and also undergraduate research at community colleges. So I, one time in my life, I served as a program director at the Division of Undergraduate Education at National Science Foundation for three years actually, 2008 to 2011. I was looking for some kind of a leader of undergraduate research at community college and I checked with the other program directors and they all said that there's one person we can name, that was a Jim Pula. Okay. That was his reputation at National Science Foundation. And then I contacted him and then he served as a mentor for the, some of the projects and so on. And then he actually secured $4 million from the National Science Foundation okay, to use grant, transforming undergraduate education in STEM. About, and then he actually is a PI and then also executive director of the CCC, CCURI, which is Community College Undergraduate Research Initiatives. He's in the fourth year, he has one more year to go, and he has a national conference actually out of the debt initiatives as well, and then Montgomery College one time hosted their annual meeting, poster section, at the Rockwell campus last year. So we have a great relationship about this one. So let me give you some of the ideas about what he did. Okay, he was a pre-med major and also biology major at Bucknett University undergraduate, and then he got a master's degree from the University of Connecticut. Then he did some doctoral training at the University of Rochester. And since then, actually, he got the faculty position, and also the, he's the director of the um, director of the biotechnology manufacturing at Finger Lakes Community College. Okay, and then also he serves as the New York Hub of uh, uh, director of the Northeast Biomanufacturing Center and Collaborative. It's NBC2, by the way, and that is actually NSF-funded uh, IT center, Advanced Technological Education Center project. And he has been uh, serving as a, you know, other boards and so on, numerous awards and so on. I do not want to elaborate too much about it. But please join me to welcome keynote speaker Jim Hume. Okay, I'm going to walk around, so I'm not good with the microphone. So if, if I if I start to do this, <laughs> right, because I forgot that I'm holding the microphone. Yeah, somebody just be like that. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the invite. Uh, they're, they're, I love coming down here. So this, uh, this, uh, as you just heard, you know, this isn't my, my first time here. Uh, but it's my first time speaking at this conference, which probably isn't a big surprise since this is the first year we've run. Uh, so I'm really happy to be part of that. I always have that on my resume that I can. Uh, I can. So I'm, I'm going to actually talk to you a little bit about CCURI and a lot about what we've learned. Now the cool thing about this is that. Most of what I'm going to say that we found out or that what we do is, is, is stuff that you already know. But maybe I'm going to say it a different way and maybe if you start to see some of the best practices you can start thinking about, thinking about how you might sort of model some of the things that you're doing. So I'll give you some examples of case studies from some of our, uh, from, from some of our partners. I always put this up first because one of the things that 
I think as community college faculty that we need to get used to doing is that when somebody asks us why are you doing undergraduate research at your institution, you have, we have to have an answer for that. Because there's still that perception out there that we shouldn't be doing undergraduate research at community college. Because for some now it's not in our mission, right? So I always like to have answers. And I use these four reports as my sort of my foundation of how I get my answers. Uh, two of them are specific to biology, the two on the left. But the two on the right are just, in general, recommendations for what we should be doing uh, with respect to STEM education. And all of them talk about undergraduate research. And, and the PCAST report, the one to the right, specifically mentions that, that undergraduate research should be done in the first two years. So if that's, if the president, right, if our government is saying that this should be done in the first two years, how is it that it shouldn't, how is it that it's not in the mission of the institutions that serve half of our undergraduate population, right? That it, it should be. So um, if you're interested, these are all basically free PDFs online that you can get to. And, and this is what they sort of all say. And this is the part where I think that if I just fly through these, you're going to be in that one that makes complete sense as to why they would recommend this, right? So what students should be doing, that a content should be delivered through process thinking skills, um, oops, <clears throat> right? As early as possible, and that has been fairly recent in the reports. That's something that, that was, you're seeing more and more. So that means when they walk in the door. So at Curry, CCURI, that's our, that's our philosophy, is that they should, they're doing it from the very first time they walk in. Uh, interdisciplinary, and they specifically mentioned math, right? So that we should be not just doing these in our little silos, but having as many disciplines involved as possible. I have a project right now going on that involves statistics, the statistics professor, our engineering group, uh, chemistry class, and my research methods and biology course. Uh, and it's, it's a very enriching experience. It takes a lot of work, but uh, deliver, so how we deliver content, right? These inquiry-based methods that everybody uses, people are all familiar with these. Um, in a collaborative setting, and then with multiple levels of mentorship. And for mentorship, we go beyond just the faculty to the student and talk about how do you get their families involved in the undergraduate research experience, right? Their community, their church. I mean, we've had people come from to poster sessions that represent the students, at, you know, not just their educational community, but their actual community, which is um, very important for them. All right, so let me tell you where we started. And I do this for all of our partners as well because what happens is, you know, you go to these conferences and they very rarely pick somebody to come up and talk to you uh, if the person has some really small thing that they did that failed, <laughs> right? It's always somebody that's done some really amazing, huge thing that's awesome. And we sit back and go, oh, I don't think I could ever do that, right? So for our partners, I have to be careful to not show them the big, 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 awesome thing but to say, here's where, here's where it can start. And it started for me many years ago when I was just starting at Finger Lakes Community College. And I'm walking down the hall, and a woman who's in the environmental science department is walking past me. She stops me and she says, Jim, I've got to ask you a question. Can you tell the sex of a red-tailed hawk from a blood cell? And I said, boy, I made a joke about can't you just turn them over and look at that. I think I, if I recall. Turns out in the juvenile phase, uh, the eastern red-tailed hawk, it's, it, there's no sexual dimorphism. Males and females look exactly the same. Now that's a problem for the, the people who do research on these birds and who track them and put bands on them and release them as part of management, because when they get to the column about the sex, they have to just leave it blank. Um, and so I thought, well, let's see if we can figure this out. I have a biotech program. We got all the equipment and instrumentation. I grabbed two biotech students. And I said, come on, let's go work on this together. For no credit, for no money, right? With limited space and limited time, and we did it, right? We just started working on it. And it was amazing. These students were going back into their classrooms, and the faculty were coming to me and saying, what have you done to these two people? Because <laughs> they are completely re-energized and want to just do, and they were knocking on my door, can we get in the lab, can we get in the lab? And I spent about six months on that with these two students, and it was the, it, it, up to that moment, it was the greatest thing that I did. And I said, we have got to do this for everybody. Everybody. Not just a class of 10 people. I'm talking about everyone, right? That was my goal. So what do I do? I make a class, right? Research methods in biology. And, I, and I'm so excited. I'm getting up to the fall semester, and I see it on the books. I'm getting all ready, and then 
Registration opens, and I'm at my computer watching the numbers. Nothing, 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 nothing. Zero, zero. The dean starts coming up to me and saying, hey, you know, we gotta get those numbers up or that class might not go, right? And then one day, all of a sudden, it was like, click, click, two students. The same two. <laughs> I called up the roster, I was like, oh, it's the same two kids, right? So it, it didn't run. And, uh, and I thought, well, how else are we going to do this, right? I, I couldn't figure this out. So I tried all different types of things, and I failed on and every single time I tried. I tried putting it into our general bio course. That didn't work. So we got pushed back from the faculty, and we had a whole bunch of adjuncts, and that was going to be a whole bunch of training that they didn't have. So I tried all these things, and we failed, and we failed, and we failed, and we failed, and we failed. I was really getting discouraged. So I said, well, what, what I have to do is I have to, I have to figure this out. And so I took an approach that might seem a little odd to you. I went and got my own training on something called root cause analysis, which, to not give a lot of detail, is essentially a suite of tools that allows you to take a problem that you have and really get deep into what the root cause of the problem might actually be. And so I spent some time learning about how to apply these tools, and then I, uh, I proposed a workshop for our faculty, our biology faculty. I said, let, let, let me just, let's just try this. They'll just work with me. And so they did. And I applied, I facilitated it, and we applied these root cause analysis tools to our actual problem, which was we were failing at doing undergraduate research at our institution. I mean, well, I shouldn't say we. Uh, I was failing, right? Uh, so let me just give you an example. This is one of the tools called the 5Y. And this is one of the published barriers for doing undergraduate research at the community college. This is published at the very top that the students aren't prepared for the experience. They come to us not ready, and that's published. Now, when we apply root cause analysis to this, if you look at the bottom of this sort of flow chart, what we found is that our problem was not that the students weren't prepared. We had an advisement problem, and we had an issue with how connected we were with the high schools that we served. Now, consider this just this one thing. What would be the solution if the problem was actually at the top there? What would you do as an institution? What, what do we do as institutions when the students come to us and they're not prepared? Remedial coursework, right? We create a developmental course or remedial, in other words, we try to prepare them. The solution, though, for us was very different because the, the way we had to fix it had something to do with advising and working with our high school teachers, which we did. That's, how, that's what we incorporated into our model. Completely different. So if we had just gone with the published barriers, and apply them to our situation, we would have tried to remediate students as part of our solution. And I'm guessing that that wouldn't work. Right? And I, I don't know because we didn't do that because we, we had the real problem, right? We figured out what it was. Oops. All right. This is what we found. This is our problem at, at Finger Lakes Community College. Okay? Now, some of the stuff's going to look obvious to you because everybody knows that, yeah, there's financial issues here. You have to have money to do undergraduate research. But when, we, when it came down to some of the other things, um, the second one is usually people just say there's no time. We actually found out that there is time. It's, it's not that we don't have enough time to do undergraduate research. It's, it's the way you're thinking about your time. You say, well, I teach 17 hours. We have to teach 17 hours, which I wouldn't be able to afford a meal for my kids if I only taught 17 hours. So I teach overloads, right? So I'm usually about 25 hours per semester. Right? Now, then you think, well, how does he have time to do undergraduate research? Because the research experience that I'm involved in has to be part of that time. The problem is we have this incompatible faculty model that we think about, right? We look at our four year institutions and we go, okay, so they have nine hours in the classroom or four hours, and then they do research. We have to sort of take that mentality and bring that model back to work what we do. So we looked at not getting release time, because our deans don't like that word. It's a dirty word in our institution. Right? It just sounds like we're giving you time off to do something. Um, we don't like that. So we had to come up with a way to redefine our jobs. And we, we piloted it with some funding. And I told the institution, if it's successful, would you be willing to then institutionalize it? And I gave them the metrics that we were going to measure. And when it was successful, they said, yeah, this is a great idea. And we went forward with this. We now have this. They have a little bit of a different faculty model when it comes to people engaged in undergraduate research, which I don't have time to get into now. It's a whole other talk, but if you're interested, I can tell you what, how we constructed that. 
Um, the other thing you'll see down here in two places is networks. This is critical. This was one that made our success or our ability to go to graduate research took off once we addressed the network issue. So I was at the University of Rochester studying adenoviral vectors for use in terminal cancer patients to knock out pain receptors in their spinal cord. And my network were researchers from all over the world that were working on that same problem. And I met with them regularly in conference calls and we went to conferences together. I had a nice network. Then I went to Finger Lakes Community College. They showed me where I, my office was, right? They gave me the courses that I was going to teach. And I, I don't feel like I talked to another professional for two years. I felt like I was just prepping my classes and grading my liver and doing this thing and going to my you know, committee work where I really wasn't talking to anybody, I was just kind of drooling, you know? <laughs> so my network dissolved around me. I felt it go away. I, just, I could just feel it go away. Uh, and it was horrible. And so we, what we know now from what work that we've done with CCRI that network creation is critical. And, and you know, we can take a school that has very little undergraduate research going on at all now, and within a year we've got them up and running, and it's, it's amazing to see. And a lot of it has to do with the networks. And then the support from administration, you have to go, oh, my own administrative support. Some of that has to do with doing what I'm doing right now, which is to you know, explain to you why it's important. Really go into depth as to why it's so important that we're actually doing this undergraduate research. And so think of the two students working on red tail hawks, for no money, no time, and no space, and no everything. And this is what Finger Lakes Community College looks like today. Okay, so this is just the research portfolio that's going on. I have people come up to me all the time and say, hey, I'm going to come visit your campus. Can you show me where you're, take me to your undergraduate research program. I can't do that. It's so embedded in everything that you do that it's not in any one place, right? Which is good, because when you have financial problems at your institution, it's easier to just find something that's isolated and chop it off, right? And you, it would be very difficult, if almost at this point impossible, to get rid of undergraduate research at a school. It's just everything. It's just what we do. It's our culture. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. All right. So when we started this Curry idea way back when, I was interested in what is the scope of undergraduate research at the community college uh, in our country? Like, what? How many? People are actually doing this, engaged in this. And I was at a conference where the results of this uh, national student survey of engagement was being given. And that's the uh, survey that's given to four year schools, to their students. And there's a question on there, and it's, it's, I, don't, I can't carry the laser pointer on these two things. But on the left, under the NESI, about halfway down, it says work on research project with faculty that are outside the courses, right? Turns out 19% of college seniors will have engaged in some kind of project or research outside of their own coursework with faculty at that school. I wanted that number for the community college. So I went to the SESI at this point. I didn't even know there was a separate survey, right? They're almost identical, almost, until you get to that question. And the corresponding question on the SESI asks about remediation, which I, I, I thought that was pretty sad. There's not, there was not a single question on the SESI that asked anything about undergraduate research. Right? So I was up against a culture in our country that has already made the assumption that it's not what we do. Right? So that was a problem. Now, on the right, I knew of these, that these schools existed. This is Mass Bay Community College. Mass Bay Community College, just outside of Boston. Uh, they have a biotech program there run by a guy by the name of Dr. Bruce Jackson. They just announced their 20th, uh, 20th Goldwater Scholar, which if you know the Goldwater program, it's a highly competitive undergraduate um, science scholarship, only 300 given out across the country every year. And in each of the years his students won, he was the only community college uh, where students were awarded this, this Goldwater. So that shows you the high level of research activity that's going on. We've had three. So normally when I get this presentation, I say between Mass Bay Community College and Finger Lakes, we have 23 Goldwater Scholars. Right? <laughs> and Bruce lets me say that, right? Then I have to say, well, we'd have three, he's got 20. But uh, so, so I knew it was I knew it's possible. I just didn't know the scale and the scope of it. Alright, so this is 
where it is today. So we were uh, awarded, I went through many phases, which I'll talk about later, before we got to this point, uh, under the TWOS program, which doesn't exist anymore. It's now been folded into IUS if you're looking at NSF, improving undergraduate STEM education. But at the time, the TWOS program had, had three tiers to it. So there was type one, type two, type three. And uh, the year we were awarded our type three award, we, we were the only type three award that year that was, that was given. It's also, it was also the first time in the history of that program, going way back to when it was ILI and, and all those other weird things that used to be, CCLI, uh, that a community college was awarded at that tier. So we, was, we were a lot of firsts, which is good, but it's also meant I mean, there's a lot of attention on us, right? NSF is very interested in this project in terms of what, what are the impact that we're next going to be able to make. And we got into all kinds of publicity, which was great. You know, I was in science for the only time in my career and the only time I ever will be. Um, and you can see there's Dave Brown there from, for the years that, that know him from NSF. Uh, he's, he's another guy that's really engaged with students in undergraduate research and is now at uh, NSF. Here's, here's our network. It's a big network. Uh, we just added the seven more under the bottom right where it says HSI partners, Del Mar, Stray Mountain, Lone Star. Those were just added as part of the supplemental award that we were able to get uh, to create a, a southwest regional network of, of Hispanic serving institutions that are all engaging in undergraduate research programs. So um, we were able to put that together and we just did their training uh, in Phoenix just a couple of weeks ago so we got them started. So it's, a, it's, it's big. Uh, you can also see, that I don't know, it's the lower left of the map there, kind of weird in the lower right, it looks like there's two schools in the ocean. Uh, the one that's in green on the right is Florida Keys Community College, and the one on the left is actually uh, Capulani Community College in Honolulu. I have to do site visits every year to all these partners. Yeah. So we like to split up amongst our co-PIs. You know, we'll make a list where we're going to go this year, and I, I, I make the list. And, uh, yeah. So I've been there a few times, right? Uh, in Hawaii. Um, so let me just let me talk about why it's important to do what you guys are doing right now, which is this that, this networking, and how important it is for you to build your programs is to be engaged in these networks. I mean, really engaged, not just showing up and saying, "Wow, I really learned a lot of things. I'm going to go back and do my my class again." But really engaged. The, in the middle there is a, you're not supposed to be able to read this. You're just supposed to be able to see this big web. Uh, is a is a little green box, and that was when I started at Finger Lakes, and I got a phone call from a woman who uh, was running an organization called BioLink, which is a network of two-year schools that have biotech programs in the country. Um, NSF-funded ATE program for years, uh, still, still a center. And she said, at, at the time, she was rattling off a whole bunch of stuff. If you know Sonny Mullen, then you know what I'm saying. It's hard to get the words to come together. But what I got was I was supposed to go to North Carolina for some meeting of biotech educators. So I went. And this is, I was a month on the job at this point. And what I did was I recorded a meeting of, the, of three people that I met there. And a mentor of mine gave me this idea a long time ago. And, and for three and a half years, I recorded every event that occurred as a result of meeting those three people. And I mind mapped it. And then I gave it to a, a person in the economics department and a local guy who I knew in the county who does economic development work. And I asked them to, to, to evaluate this for value to the institution. My engagement in this network, what's the value? Uh, I started my biotech program with $24,000. Now, if you, if you have a biotech program, you realize that barely buys the consumables, right? So we were stretched. But I was told by these economic development folks that this network was worth about $1.2 million to my institution. Now, some of that's direct, right? Uh, to the one on the right, the branch is going off to the right. At one point in there, uh, we got a $10,000 donation of supplies from a bio. Bank. So some of that's easy to measure. But I would not have had that donation if I hadn't met the person who already had the contracts and was doing the way. So this is the type of stuff where, by being heavily engaged in networks, you do grow quickly, much faster than if you're not. And so I told NSF that I'm going to build a network, right? This is important that we do this. Because uh, if, if we don't, then what do we plug into? We have things like this, which is great. And this, there's a lot of states now that I think are doing more and more of this. Uh, and we need to all be thinking about doing more of this. Because Curry can't fund everyone, right? But networks can be put together. All right, so we, we provide our partners with a program development map. And 
this is kind of the map that we developed as part of um, what we do when we think about training institutions that want to do this. So starting with the education piece, there's a lot of now, there's actually there's now two publications from Kerr, Council on Undergraduate Research, that are specific to community colleges. So undergraduate research at the community college, Kerr and I have two publications, two monographs. One just came out that you'll, you want to go and get. They're, uh, they're free and um, they, again, they're specific to what's going on with community colleges. The self-study was really important to us. And we're finding this out with our partners. Remember I said we did this sort of root cause analysis, right? And that was us looking inside ourselves. When we ask some of our other partners to do the same thing, it's interesting the barriers, the things that they come up with, sometimes are very different than what our challenges were. And we're finding very quickly that all of our partners are, are very different with respect to what their challenges are, what their obstacles are. So we have to, as part of our workshop, and we have to help them do that internal look inside ourselves to find out what it is. Because if you just want the literature, time, money, space, be spending a lot of time trying to address those three things, when in reality there's probably some deeper things that are getting in the way that you need to really take a look at. Okay. And, you know, the, the, the adopting models, we have three models that we help our partners with that we've been working on for a long time, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, infrastructural elements, like things like an IRB. I mean, how many of you have those, right? <laughs> I hear a few. All right, how about this one? Who has an IACUC? Ah, I kind of got you. <laughs> Who knows what an IACUC is? Okay, so this is an, this is an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. Uh, when I started at, at Finger Lakes, we had a lab, a biology lab, with a whole bunch of things like flying squirrels and all sorts of stuff to use as demonstration in the lab. <laughs> we were in violation of several <laughs> federal regulations at that point. Yeah, you can't do that, apparently. So, we have a lot of animal studies that we conduct, and so we have to get an eye way to create one. And so some of these things we have to, you just have to do, we have, this is what we help our partners with. And obviously, I should, probably should have put assessment at the first, up at the top. If there's any assessment coordinators in here, you often like to think, right? Just think about assessment all along, not just at the very end, right? <clears throat> all right, so what are we unique with? We are not, what Curry does is we're not, we're not adding to the literature on the benefits of undergraduate education. We're just not. That literature is so rich that it would not make sense to try to reproduce some of those results. It's, we know it's important that we do undergraduate research. We know it's powerful on an institutional level, on a faculty level, and on a student level. It's not just students. It, has, it is effective in many ways. What we're doing, what we're adding that's unique is models for doing this in the first two years that has a transfer piece on the end of it. Right? That's unique to us. So we look at the uniqueness of us as being things that we can really address as questions that are currently out there. You know, what is the impact of undergraduate research on underrepresented groups at the community colleges? Um, we, there's plenty of studies to show that it increases persistence in STEM for underrepresented groups, but that's usually been done in these sort of longitudinal studies. They go from a four-year school into graduate school. But what about when, you, when you're at a rural community college where the students come in and they have no clue what they want to do, and you get them into a STEM program, how does the research experience keep them there? Is it, does it improve their persistence? So that, that's, that's where I think we can add to, uh, to, the, to the method. Ooh, did I? This thing is tricky. Thanks. So here's, the, here's essentially, this is taking this, these models and kind of boiling them down to a very simple slide. Um, so what we do is we, we look at three ways that, that undergraduate research is built into programs. Either as a course-based experience, so you'll see Cure up there. So that's a, an actual single course of the research experience that's going to happen. Uh, a Sure, which is a summer undergraduate research experience. That's a, a you know, the typical model you think of as like an REU where you've got an 8 to 12 week experience over the summer. And then a Pure, which is where they're going through a degree program and they're getting the undergraduate research experience throughout several courses, right? a program-based research experience. And what we do is we make sure that the research that's going on at the institution is connected to the classroom in very specific ways. So we, we use these inquiry-based methods like problem-based learning and case study method of teaching to develop new curriculum for the intro chemistry, the intro bio, the intro courses you know, in physics. Um, that A, deliver content for that class, 
but, but B, engage them early on in what the research question actually is. Um, so that's the hook. We change the intro courses to, to hook them, and in many of those cases, there's a laboratory experience that's associated with it, so they can actually get their hands wet a little bit. Uh, if they like what they're doing, then we make sure we provide opportunities for them to do it at a larger scale, right? a true research experience that they get, either in the first or second year, in many cases, in, uh, in both. And then along the way, we do a ton of faculty development. Uh, we, that's one of the things that we spend a lot of time with. So I think about um, when I got to Fingerlinks, there was a uh, professor there teaching molecular biology. And this was to our biotech students. And he, he, he had gotten his, his degree 25 years ago. And I went in and it, what he was teaching was molecular biology from 25 years ago. And I don't blame him, right? He's been disconnected from, the, from that field for so long that the, the contemporary methods he's hadn't caught up with it. So we make sure that not only with the research methods are we doing a lot of faculty development, but also with the teaching methods that I just talked about. So we run workshops on laboratory-based uh, uh, you know, techniques and field methods and all these things so that they can get those contemporary uh, techniques that they need for their research. Here's the other thing that we spend a lot of time doing, is analyzing barriers. And I'm going to try to walk you through this a little bit. Maybe I will get my pointer, because uh, we did this actually when we were here. We were in Bethesda, and then did the poster session at the Rockwell campus. And we brought into that national conference our entire group, but we also brought in about 30, 30, 35 educators from other community colleges that weren't doing undergraduate research. And we put them through this, a, a very time-consuming and horribly painful analysis to try to look at, uh, is there a difference between the actual barriers to doing undergraduate research at community college and the perceived barriers. Because the hypothesis is that people aren't engaging in undergraduate research at the community college because the perceived barriers that they have are just seem to be too much to overcome. And it kind of keeps them from getting close to it. This is, this is just the analysis from the actual barriers. So that's what I brought, brought with me today. And what this is, is this is just the analysis for if you wanted to create a brand new course brand new course that involves students in undergraduate research. Our faculty were telling us that the three most important tasks for doing that is to get your administrative support, your departmental support, and then recruit students into it. Right? Recruiting students for a new course is a really important step. These were came out as the barriers for each of those tasks. What's interesting about this, I think, is that many of the published reports on barriers are very faculty and institution focused. Time, money, space, administrative support. Yet in reality, for our new course, one of the biggest challenges is this. And we're particularly getting that one right now. Right? We have a fan of credit limits. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Anti that exactly. You create a new course, and if it's not part of the degree and it's not required and there's financial aid implications for that. That course that I created with the two students signed up that are right, that was our problem. Right? This is this is an issue. It's a it's a big issue. And it's not, you don't see it published as much. So we're spending a lot of time doing that. And I've already done the initial analysis on the perceived barriers and this does not show up. Which is kind of interesting. The people that are not doing undergraduate research aren't thinking about that. Which I thought was kind of uh, kind of well, I don't know if it's cool, but at least we can tell them, right? Okay, we also help people with looking at things that are unsustainable. Things that we know can kill a program at a community college if you're not careful. A lot of this has to do with stuff that, like, you, it's, it's obvious, right? So if you're relying on paying students or faculty outside of what they're normally doing to do research over and over and over again, you're going to be chasing money all the time. This is what RU programs do constantly. They're always looking for the, they've got to re -up, get their RU program going uh, again. Um, really, really important. I know we have a lot of community colleges in our network who know other schools that said, oh, this school's got a great undergraduate research program. But here's their program. They find eight really good students, and they send them across the street to the R1 institution that's right across the street. They go there for a summer, and then they come back. 
Well, that sounds great to me, but that's not your undergraduate research program, right? That's their undergraduate research program. So we work really hard on making sure that when the people are building programs, that they're thinking about how we're going to do that in-house. How do we keep it inside? It's important for building the, 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 the growing that program is if it's done in-house. Obviously, stuff like you've got to have, although I learned there's, what, two NMRs in the... Two, yeah, there's like a... $500,000 piece of equipment apparently in this beautiful new building then, right? Um, uh, and, and then also disconnected from the regular academic program. So if you've, got, if you've got a research project that you can't connect up to a course that you're teaching, that can be very unsustainable. It's, it's unsolvable. Alright, so let's look at a case study. Uh, we look at our partners all the time and we say, which ones do we think are set up for success? We've done a lot of work on looking at what are the important elements for successful programs. And things like um, having a plan, having an actual strategic plan, not just winging it, but a real long-term strategic plan. Um, having these top-down drivers, is it an administrative priority? If, if, if people tell me, oh, well, the reason why we don't go to graduate research at our community college is we don't have the money. Well, that's not true. That's not true. And don't let people tell you that. It's that the money that you're spending is being spent on priorities other than undergraduate research. That's the answer, right? We just paid a consultant at our institution, this is no lie, to work on our logo. <laughs> I could have run my research class for five semesters with the money we paid that one individual to make sure that the green was the right color. Now, I'm making fun. Our logo is beautiful. I love our logo. But the point is, is that if someone, if they tell me that I'm, ne I'm never going to allow anyone to give me that answer, that we don't have the money for it. You're lying. If we don't have the money for it, then we're not an institution. We have no money. We do have the money for it. Right? So, top-down drivers, is it a priority for an institution? is really critical. Um, is it embedded? Is it, it says there, uh, CCUR faculty development. Partners who have taken advantage of our faculty development. The guy on the right has been at every single event we've ever offered. He is faculty developed through the roof. Right? We, we know that these things are important. And we have about five institutions that really hit all of these. And Volunteer State is one. They're at, uh, and they're in Tennessee. Uh, the, the team that I'm showing you here, the three students, just got back from the uh, regional ACS meeting. Uh, they entered their poster uh, in the organic chemistry group. There were 80 posters presented in that group. One from a community college, that was Ball State, and they won. <laughs> right? And I just listed some of the universities that were there just so you can see some of the names. This was a big deal. Now, why? Why, 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 was this, why were they so successful? Because Paris Powers is on the right there. It is very engaged in research, but it's all focused with students. And he's got all that stuff on the right. Right? The top-down support. He's fully engaged in the network. He's got lots of collaborators now. Uh, and that gets back to the students. And they made, they did this study that was unbelievable, and I can't even understand the poster. I tried. So, if you're a chemist and you want, if you come up and ask me what was the research on, forget it. I'll have to send you a link. Right. Um, we, we evaluate all the time. We evaluate on three levels. It's not, it's not just looking at impact on students. We often forget that there's a, you know, an impact on, uh, on faculty, that they get re-engaged. My wife saw that in me when I started doing work. I came from a pure research background because I chose to do it. Right? Every, every experience I remember as an undergraduate in my biology education is around some project. I do not remember a single lecture given to me in, in general bio or intro bio at, at Bucknell University. I can't remember one. But I do remember counting rings on scales from NASA groupers that were collected in leaves. And, and I, I just remember that project. Um, so we, we look at not just students, but faculty and actually uh, institutions as well. Uh, we have Washington State University is our evaluator. There's a whole group there that's experts on this stuff. So we partner with them and uh, pay them a lot of money to help us analyze all this data that we're generating and cranking out. And uh, we're pretty pleased, very pleased with the results that we see so far. <coughs> Plenty of places for you to see us uh, if you want us to check out more. Obviously, we've got a website. It's pretty static. I'll, I'll warn you, it's static. Um, but there is, uh, we do have a calendar on there so you can see what events that we're holding that are coming up next. 
Our Facebook page, for whatever reason, seems to get the most traffic. It's also the most updated because we have somebody that does that pretty regularly. So everything that happens kind of just spits out at you through uh, Facebook. We got LinkedIn and things like that. So you can have a look at that. But I, I wanted to finish up actually before we do questions with talking to the administrators. And this worked for me. And I, it, it, it seems so obvious, but it. It shocked me when I started saying this that people hadn't thought of that. But if you if you come to if you come to Finger Lakes Community College, I can show you four classes side by side, and they are as follows: the HVAC program, which I guess that's like duck work and things, HVAC, uh, the music recording technology program, the nursing program. And what I'm calling our natural sciences program, or AS Science program. Right? In the music recording technology program, if you walked in there right now, there's students in a real studio, there's real musicians behind the glass, and they're actually recording music. The HVAC students are building ductwork and doing instrumentation, and the nursing students are in a nursing lab that looks exactly like a hospital. You walk in, you swear you're in a hospital, and there's beds, and there's a nursing station, they're actually doing that. You walk into General Bio, where our bio majors are sitting right now, and you'll see what I'm doing to you right now. This is the absolute worst thing I should be doing to you to teach you about Curry. Put you in a room, looking at a two-dimensional uh, structure here, with my talking head, blah, 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 you guys all staring at me, right? This is, this is, this. so if we are okay, right, with doing that for our science students, then that's a problem. Can you imagine if I proposed that for a music recording technology that we certify those students in that degree program by putting them in a room like this and having me go through PowerPoint slides on what a music recording studio looks like and go with a laser pointer, when you want to turn up the treble, push that button, right? Or even worse, with nursing. Can you imagine sending them out to court? Learning nursing from PowerPoint lectures, right? So we would not be okay with any of those other degree programs if we took away the experiential part of it for their training. But yet we allow students to walk in our front door saying, I want to be a biology major. They tell us that. And we're, we follow them to a classroom where they sit in a chair for 15 weeks and stare at PowerPoint slides. And we're okay with that. We, I, I can't imagine how that's even possible, right? So I, I did send that to my administrators, and they and like, you know, I never really thought of it that way. It's because we don't think of it, right? People aren't, that message is not getting out, that it's not okay. That if, if you are, if we are training scientists, then they need, they, they don't need to. They have to be practicing the craft. They have to be. Otherwise, we're not doing our job. So if I, if, if I have a faculty that don't want to do it because they're like, oh, it's too hard, I say, you're so concerned about your teaching, you really are a good instructor, but yet you stop to think about what you're doing when you think about training students for science. You, if you really stop and think about it, you, you have to be doing undergraduate research. You just have to. And so it has to become a priority for our administrators. It has to become a priority for us. And it has to be a, a team effort. It can't be one person going, I'm just going to do it. Yay! Right? Because if you go away, your research goes away. If, you're, if your institution is doing undergraduate research and you say, well, it's really just me, but it's really good, right? And you're doing it on your own time and you're not being paid and rewarded for it, well, guess what? When you go away, who's going to walk in and go, that looks like a great idea, I'll do that, right? From the outside, it looks like you're crazy. From the outside today, when I looked at what you guys what you do with your chemistry uh, students, Ross, I was like, 5.30 in the morning until 8 at night on a Saturday? Something ridiculous. I'm like, who would sign up for that, right? So anyway, so I always like to finish with that because I, I'd like you to walk past your science class or think about your own class. If you're teaching biology or chemistry and you're teaching it in a way that doesn't teach the craft and you have students in that room that say, I want to be a scientist, right? Think about nursing and record music recording. It, we just have, it just has to change. And so what do we do? We help. What, what we do is we say, all right, all the stuff that you need, you saw the Ball State example, we'll help you with that, with models, with faculty development, with outlets for students to present posters, with places for you to network, right, for you to collaborate with your project. That's our job, right? That's what Kurt
Curry does. That's our mission. It's our vision. It's what we do. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. research projects with my students, but it's just me. Um, I have a question, which is, do you know if anybody in the social sciences takes this similar approach? Because most of my research experience has been in social science, and that's a very nice um, companion to statistics, teaching statistics. And if not, if you've never heard of anyone like that, what would you recommend if there was an interest in that? Okay, so, yeah, that's a good question. Um, if people ask us, do we have social scientists in our network? And I should start off by saying Curry started out almost entirely in the biological sciences because that was my background, but has moved into environmental science, chemistry. Uh, we have one physics group, we have an engineering group, uh, and we have one or two institutions that have um, social science programs. I am just not a social scientist. That when they talk to me about their research, it sounds very different in my biology brain than what I would consider research, um, but I listen to them. And as it turns out, the models work perfectly well for them, so in terms of the, the, the change in the curriculum. Hi, I am Amrita Madhush from Baltimore City Community College. It's absolutely a wonder to hear you today. Um, I remember that one year ago I was sitting in my office and all along is reading the paper that your program um, was approved. Uh, you know, I just I seeing it in action is like actually like seeing your words come true. Your action is like, so much more powerful than um, so it was, it was an absolute pleasure to hear you today. I just wanted to ask like if I am one of few faculty doing research. How, I mean, in, in your scenario, how did, did other faculty get motivated to get produce and music, and I mean, how, how did all that happen? Right, so, so two, two parts of that. The, the, the general question has to do with how do you get other faculty involved. If you're a one-person show, uh, which I was at the time, I, 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 I had to do two different things. Um, if, I, if I approached somebody and gave them the message, and they responded negatively to that, I stopped asking. I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to spend energy trying to convince somebody that this is the important thing to do if they're not willing to hear the message because I think the message is perfectly clear. So I stop asking. But the second piece, which is now coming around, which is even better, is through evaluation and assessment. Everybody I know has got that on their mind all the time. In New York, we're getting it really heavy. When we're looking at learning outcomes and, and impact on what we do with students, the data is so clear that that putting these students through these experiences has wonderful benefits for many of our outcomes, that the administrators look at that and go, okay, you guys are all going to be doing this now, right? So there's that, if it works type of thing, then that's what we're going to do as an institution now. So they don't have a choice, right? That's, that's the thing. They can continue to do what doesn't work and get poor student learning outcomes and poor people of students. But the administration's not going to let that go on very long. So, I, my philosophy is to use evaluation and assessment data to, to get the top-down driver in our partners. That's what I, I tell them. We, can, we, we can't be constantly chasing after people and hoping that they'll get involved. But it's important that, that they do, right? It just needs to be an institutional effort. You saw how it's grown in Finger Lakes, that, that list of projects. That's three different departments and about 13 different faculty that are now all involved. Um, I'm from the Community College of Auburn County, and we have um, isolated faculty that are doing undergrad research, and, and um, we keep thinking of ways of getting money, and so I was just wondering, have you, do you know of anyone in your network that has ever tapped into Perkins funding to support undergrad research? I don't, and I don't know enough about Perkins 
to know why or why not. But, but well, I should say that instrumentation and equipment. I know people have got to refer to, but they use it for other for other people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name is Antonio Castillo from Rockville Campus of Montgomery College. Um, you've been mentioning about the, how important it is to assess the successful of um, undergraduate research program. Can you um, develop on that? What type of tools do you use to, to assess the success? Thank you. So in terms of assessment, we do, we do a couple things. We look at um, sort of the hard impacts, which is time to graduation, uh, persistence from semester one to semester two. So this is all institutional data that we use to look at, you know, as, as an undergraduate research as a classroom intervention, does it have effects on those numbers? We also look at some, uh, we're, we're looking at some important outcomes like impacts on critical thinking. So things that students will need to improve on if they want to become better scientists. Now the instruments that we use, the instrument that we use is an instrument called the CAT test. If you've ever heard of this, critical thinking assessment test, it's out of Tennessee Tech. Um, it's very difficult to find a validated instrument to measure skills, research skills in students. You can create your own, but again, it's the, it's the validated piece that's difficult. So we're sort of stuck with using tools that are already out there, like David Lopato's surveys we use, if you've not heard of those, because they've just been around forever. People, they, the community accepts that it's a validated instrument. But that's still self-reported student data. Right? They're still saying, I liked it and I did this. Um, so we're always looking for ways to try to really measure actual impact. But it's very difficult and extremely expensive. That's the other problem, right? When you have a grant, if you're spending it all on evaluation, then there's no program. So you're not really making anything. So that's tricky. Um, undergraduate research is an extremely effective way to retain our students and staff. There's no question about it. All the leaders who say that. But it's expensive, as you said, okay? Either during the summer program or whatever, actually. It requires a lot of resources and so on. So one thing actually Montgomery College uh, did last year, and the, I think that it's implemented this semester in biology, is that uh, providing research experience using the laboratories, which is part of the course, so what we did was out of 15 weeks, the last five weeks or something like that, the first week we did research, second, third week conducted experiments, and the fourth week did analysis, fifth week kind of presentation. And this is the way to increase the number of students impacted by research experience, not really independent research. Have you learned anybody else is uh, exploring this kind of things nationwide? Yeah, so this is, this, this is actually one of the, one of the um, ways that we help our partners by taking, we, we workshop with the research project that they have, and do we do what's called a curriculum alignment. Like how does that project align with the course that you're teaching, and then how can we get pieces of that project into the class that, right, so that it, for broader impact. So, here's my example, the Red Tail Hawk. By the way, it's not our logo for that reason, right? When you look at Curry, the Red Tail Hawk is. Um, so once we got this research project up and running, it was successful and we were doing well with it. Uh, we, had a, we had a sequence of three labs in our general bio course. It was uh, DNA extraction, so biologists, DNA extraction, uh, polymerase chain reaction, electrophoresis. And for the DNA extraction, we used strawberries. So they would extract the DNA from a strawberry, and then they'd school it and go, woo! Now what, right? Lab over. Polymerase chain reaction, which is how you an instrument that you used to amplify genes, we would give them DNA that we bought from a vendor, and they would run it, and then they'd go, yay. And then in electrophoresis, which is the following that, they would take these colored dyes, and they, so for those who don't know, electrophoresis looks like a hard piece of jello, and you put stuff in it, and you turn your electricity on, and you can do proteins and DNA. We would give them dye, so they could see it, and the dyes would run at different, at different speeds, and people would be like, wow, green's faster. <laughs> so erase those, erase that. Now picture this. Here's my group in general body, right? I hand them a little vial of red tail hawk blood. And a little card with a picture that shows when the date was caught, all the morpho morphological characteristics that we measured on the bird. Um, and they can name it if they want. Lab one, they extract the DNA from the blood. Lab two, they run a PCR to identify the gene for sex. 
lab three, they run on electrophoresis gel, and they actually determine that it's male or female. They provide the data point back to the project. They're doing research, right? Didn't cost any more. In fact, it cost less because the blood was free. We got it. And I have the scars to prove it, right? And I have the scars to prove it. So we look for opportunities for that to happen because all my students from then on, once we started doing this in general bio, and now general chemistry and our engineering, all the students that end up in our research classes now have, have been engaged at that level. And it didn't cost anything. It, honestly, I'm telling you right now, that's, that did not cost anything to do. So now what we do is in our research methods classes, we incorporate new projects into those classes, things that are new to our institution. We work them up, get them really well, and then we do our alignments, and then we push projects back down to replace labs that are in there. So it's sort of our training ground, right? And so this next year, um, we've been doing DNA barcoding. We're going to change an entire another suite of labs in Genobio to engage in that project. So yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, please join me to thank the few things that I want to, want to be able to, to chat with here. First of all, I am pleased to say that uh, uh, Bone Clones has donated a skull for one lucky community college here in Preston Center today. Um, so they donated this, and, and we're going to allow one, one person to take it back home. And so we have each community college represented here in, in this box. But of course, you can't trust me, right? Because I'm just me. You can trust me. Of your, your brochure, 
you will see that there's a steering committee. You can contact one of those. Make sure you contact myself, John Hammond, or Raza Khan. We will, we will be working on getting this organized for future years. We're especially interested in your feedback right now as well. Right? So if you're thinking, you know, on your drive home, oh, I wish they would have done this, or, or here's a great idea for a speaker next year or for something, please let us know. Right? We're, we're kind of thinking about everything, including host institutions, things we want to have on the schedule, things we don't want to have on the schedule, you know, what kind of food you want to have, <laughs> any of those things. So if you have feedback about anything, please, please let us know. We are going to post uh, a lot of the presentations and some videos and pictures on Facebook. Some of them are posted already. So if you get on Facebook and search for uh, Maryland Collegiate STEM Conference, you will be able to find a Facebook page and you'll be able to, to get pictures that you want. You can share them back to your own institutions to, to help promote this for, for next year's event. At 2 o'clock, I'm pleased to say we don't have just our six presentations that we've been having before. We actually have a seventh presentation, um, Jen Ash's presentation uh, that was listed excellently at, at 9 o'clock. is going to be uh, also presented at the 2 o'clock in uh, BE 107. So I'm down this way. There's a, there's a class, the first class we're going to come to um, will, will be Jen Ash's presentation. I'm write down statistics. What's the title? Actually, I'm going to be talking about probably about um, how I set up my Right, so, so research and statistics will, will, will now be um, in, in uh, 107, and instead of the list in uh, a classroom that wasn't. I would like to take just a moment after, after this, um, and before a 2 o'clock uh, 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 session starts, to do, do another a quick picture. I've got a lot of great people here. I want to be able to, to have this so we can look back on the, on the, on the first annual and say, here's the fact is out of this, and all the great people who were, were able to participate. So if you head up to the doors by the, the registration, We'll do a quick picture and get everyone back in the session by, by 2 o'clock. Thank you to all of you.